think the general format, Pat, was that you were just going to give a sort of a general mm -hmm. outline on, mm -hmm. on, 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 on the, the life and times of Grassy Gibbon and his contribution, presumably, to Scottish culture, in particular working class and rural class, working class culture. And then we're just going to have a general discussion. I brought along some poems that we, we can read if oh, we need to fill out the time, yeah. you know. And it gives me a practice run for next Monday night at Leith at the, the, the Doctors Club, you know, <laughs> for the, the night of culture about poetry and the working class. So that should be quite good, you know. So I've just pulled the mixture of stuff together. So I'll read them because some of you may have heard them before, but some is quite good. So without further ado, Pat. Right, thanks. Uh, I prepared some notes. This, this is my former Trades Council, of course. I'm a, I'm a member of this Trades Council. I come for this area. So um, and thanks to Morning Star for inviting me to do this. Um, I was on to John a few weeks ago to make it clearer and have clarified for me how much was required. Uh, I was becoming slumpy alarmed that I was going to have to do the definitive analysis of Lewis Gossett given the new work. He tried to say with me about James Connolly, you know, and yeah, I just thought, well, yeah. I'll do my own wee bit on that. Uh, uh, I was thinking of leaving the country for a bit, but John reassured me that that wouldn't be necessary. So um, I've, I've prepared some notes on about three aspects of, of uh, his work. I just focus on, on, um, on the Scots queer, um, particularly. Uh, make some observations in that, just for the act, uh, the, po the viewpoint of an active trade unionist who also happened to be brought up in a, a tenant hill farm, just over the hill from from the How of the Merns, where where uh, where James Leslie Mitchell was was uh, brought up, and I'll refer to him as Mitchell just to so sort of, um, the assumed name is a bit of a mouthful. Three particular aspects were one the central character Chris Guthrie. Uh, another the extent to which he analysed accurately the state of the countryside in the 20th century. Uh, and the third and related point is whether his anti-capitalist standpoint impaired his, uh, impaired his standing as, as, as an artist has been argued by some of his critics. But don't worry, I'm not going to labour these for now. Um, Mitchell's creation of Chris has been subject to much analysis over the years, including uh, analysis from a feminist perspective. It's also been said more than once that read, uh, women readers identify with Chris Guthrie uh, and men are all a little bit in, in love with her. Um, I must say from a first read of the books I identified with, with, with Chris and I was very um, heartened to hear recently, to read recently that Jesse Kesson also uh, identified with, with Chris Guthrie and I have much admiration for Jesse Kesson. Um, but there are elements of Chris which might lead the reader from another planet to guess that she was written by a man. So it's not the ideal feminist model, the tendency to go upstairs and strip off and admire her own physical charms. It's not that typical, I think, especially in a freezing cold, drafty, northeast farmhouse, or even in a man's, which I don't imagine was much more comfortable for doing that kind of thing. Um, however, it's not really reasonable to expect that she should be a, f a feminist model, given um, the time and, um, in which Mitchell wrote and that he was a man. Chris has portrayed as being aware of the tension between commitment to the land and education and it's certainly true that a, a university education can distance you from the land and, and I suppose that uh, also reflects my own experience but um, when she was pondering the different aspects of her own character though it always grated with me slightly much though I loved uh, Sunset Song um, that she would refer to that part of her character as the English Chris. Uh, in one way it grated with me because respect for education has always been quite strong in Scotland, including in rural Scotland, though not universally so, um, obviously. But however, um, you know, I, I, I don't imagine that he meant that to be taken literally because in fact it's actually quite an accurate reflection of Scottish habits of thought which are that, you know, anything which, um, it's, it's when, when Chris wants to um, um, represent the other aspect of character which values education and is irritated or troubled by um, the habits and mannerisms of her family and neighbours, uh, she thinks she's the English Chris, and it's, it's that thing about describing as en English um, aspects of Scottish life which are all about class and have nothing to do with national identity. Um, but English is used to, 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 as a shorthand uh, to represent stuff. It doesn't, and it, 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 was, it was accurate that he should use it, it was right that he should use it, because that's what people say uh, in the countryside, and, and the reason you know, it, it um, struck with me, even if negatively, was because I've been taking that on much of my, my adult life, you know, pointing out to people what they're talking about as class. 
Um, the other thing which occurs to me when considering Cress in the light of feminism is there's a sense in which she, the losses she suffers are paradoxically leave her with an unusual degree of choice for that time, how she lives her life. Over the, sp the space of just a few years, her entire immediate family is wiped from the face of the novel completely, and she's still in her teens, including the desperately traumatic death of her mother uh, at her own hand and, and of the twins uh, by being poisoned by the mothers, by them <coughs> their mother. Um, her father's will, leaving all his gear and £300 solely to her, is, is uh, a bit surprising as well. It's a significant amount of money for a tenant farm to, to have accrued in the years before the First World War, especially as this was just a few years after he'd lost his tenancy in Echt and had to move his family and all his gear, including six kids, across the hills to the Howe of the Mountains. However, Chris was the main vehicle of his, his, his novels, and it was probably um, very wise of him to make sure that she had proper fuel for her engine. Uh, and it's, it's set up that way, the book is set up that way, and she's a very fine character to carry them, I have to say. Minor quibbles and qualifications are, are aside, it's a very strong character. Uh, but it's not the only strong character. The, the, the characters in Sunset Song, in particular Che and, and Long Rob, um, are also very strong characters, which, which made an impression on me, having a, um, a, an avowed socialist. Uh, in the, the, the countryside as a, a, a farmer um, Im impressed me because I didn't hear much talk of class politics when I grew up uh, on the farm and the, the book helped me to put a context, a class context and on my own background and, and where I came from which I found at the time useful and helpful um, I, I think it's fair to say but also Long Rob was a very strong character if, if men responded well to Chris uh, as a woman, I think there probably was a, an element of that for, for, for me certainly as a young woman and finding Long Rob an attractive figure who had an independence of mind that, that made him very attractive. As for the state of the countryside, I think he thinks of value to say about the forces of capitalism as he impinged in the countryside in that period. The concentration of farmer into, farming into larger units continued throughout the 20th century and certainly marked um, my childhood. Um, in my youth I saw the effects of those forces, the increase in mechanisation causing the loss of farm workers' jobs and then causing the loss of farms and the loss of tenancies uh, as, as um, people had to give way to larger, uh, larger uh, production units, uh, if you like. And it's still continuing now, my sister and I were discussing it as we passed by the farm that we were raised in a few days ago, which is now part of three farms that have been um, grouped together. And the, um, I, I mean, I thought the farms around me when I grew up, um, and those tenancies were nearly all owned by Lord Cowdery for most of her childhood. And I had thought that the tenancies, the, the, the farms, the boundaries between them and the families around them were, were, were the denier of permanence for me as a child. But of course they weren't. The sons went off to do something else with their lives, including my own brother. Um, and the stewardship, the wider stewardship of the land, uh, was also impacted by that. By the time we were children, the Forestry Commission owned uh, swathes of land and um, and, and the woodlands around, and the straight ranks of spruce and fir, you know, with uh, not much living in them, um, certainly made a difference to the countryside. But but um, the passage where Chase Strachan is in leaf from the war and he's mourning and lamenting the loss of the woodlands which are being torn down for money uh, in the war. Um, is, is, is still quite painful to read. Um, and Mitchell may have been slightly hazy about various things about his geography, you know, and can like, take refuge in Port Lethen and their way over the Slug Road at night. Mm. Okay, he's forgotten slightly since he went to Welland Garden City. And sometimes the language, uh, using Meekle instead of Muckle, and uh, assuming you might get a BA from Aberdeen University. But they're all minor and significant things. And in fact, the way that he has Che uh, talk about the potential future effects on the land of the loss of the woodland um, uh, uh, strikes a strong chord with me. He could have passed as a modern environmentalist. He had a knowledge and a grasp of, of the effects, causes and effects in the land, um, which, which, um, wh which are, are still telling now. Um, so William Mitchell as an artist, um, is the value of his work impaired by his political intent? I would strongly argue that it's not. The uses of use of characters such as Long Rob and Che to present particular viewpoints in the course of arguments with neighbours is well done in my view. Um, it's a technique that if done clumsily can 
undermine the credibility of your characters entirely um, and t uh, d destroy the, you know, the credibility they can't carry the case. But Mitchell never does that. And the use of his idiosyncratic, slightly off the wall narrator voice, um, you want to give the narrator a slap sometimes. And, and you know, it's, it's, not, um, it's not Mitchell's voice, it's, 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 it makes you feel that you're not being overly manipulated. There's something quite interesting uh, about the narrator voice, which is useful. But the novels of the queer engage with the crucial issues of the early 20th century in the light of Mitchell's passionate socialism. Issues of class politics, poverty, address the context of both city and countryside. Uh, and it's still necessary in cities at times to remind people of rural poverty and its different nature. Uh, it's not always obvious from the, the, the city. Um, the decline of rural communities, the degradation and poverty which accompany capitalist industry, particularly if it's poorly organised uh, in, in cities. Um, the corrupting of evil of war and the oppressiveness and the ultimate meaninglessness of religion in face of class relations are all addressed in a cohesive and memorable fashion. Um, the novels all have a strength, strong sense of place, but the humanity and poetry in the novels, I believe, lifts them well above the Scottish context, never mind the, the context of the, the men's. And I'll, I'll just briefly illustrate what I mean by the way I, th I think that he addressed uh, the issue of war as it impacts on Kinradi. Uh, the floors of the forest is a repeated refrain through Sunset Song, including Chris and Ewan's wedding. She sings floors of the forest uh, with, with um, foreshadowing what happens to, 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 to Ewan later. Um, but it's sung as entertainment before the war is ever upon them. When the war does come, the developing sp spirit of jingoistic patriotism uh, in the parish is devastatingly illustrated, I believe, by the rapid deterioration in Long Rob's standing in the community as he continues to stand out against, against the war. The sermon of the Re Reverend Gibbon is instrumental in raising the mob who go along to the mill to teach him a lesson. A subsequent account of his refusal to go to the barracks Stabadine, his arrest, the state he comes back in and the ultimate decision to go off to the war after all, from which he never returns, are really painful to read. Um, and at Blah Weary, Chris's bewilderment and anger at Ewan's decision to join up are not alleviated when he comes home and leave coarse and cruel, uh, corrupted by the war. Of course, he has had to develop those defences for himself because he's an entirely alien situation, having to build some sort of comradeship with, with, with total strangers who are his fellow soldiers uh, in a, a, a setting that he could never have dreamt of. Uh, in advance, but for Chris it's a, it's a rejection and it's a horrible parting, uh, given that it was a, the last partner parting. When the news arrives of his death, she has to put up with uh, characters telling he died fine for his country he died, which drives Chris to an angry outburst. Country and king, you're havering, havering. What, to do with, what had they to do with my Ewan? What was a king to him? What a damned country? Blah weary says land, and it's near his wife that others fight war. And I don't think that's a parochial protest. It's a cry of universal significance in defence of human values um, and, and um, the things that really matter to people. It's a protest against all the braying politicians and fools in parliaments and palaces who decide they're not up to diplomatic effort, so they will just send other people along to kill um, and, and be killed. But it's Che, home and leave, who brings news of the real circumstances of Ewan's death. Uh, he had deserted in a blink of fine weather. Ewan's reasons for deserting are reported by Che in Ewan's own words. It was that wind that came with the sun. I minded Blaweri. I seemed to waken up smelling that smell and I couldn't believe it was me that stood in the trench. It was just daft to be there. So I turned and got out of it. And when morning came, his last words to Che, Oh man, mind me, when next you hear the pee wits over Blaweri, look at my lass for me when you see her again, close and close, for that kiss I'll never gear. And Che had to leave him then, blinded by tears, and never saw you again, for they killed him that morning. And that tells really strong things about the nature of war and what it means in real people's lives, you know. And Chris thanks Che and is glad that he told her, for he's given you and back her in a real sense. Uh, she now understands he'd not become a permanent stranger as he seemed to when he came and leave. He died for her in Blaweri, not for some meaningless concept. Um, and the fine way that that message is expressed is consistent with the rest of Leslie M M Mitchell's treatment uh, of, of the war. And it's, it's universal in its nature, I believe, and it's, it's a very fine treatment. Um, 
And grey granite the tone's different, not least because the unified voice of a single community, the U of Kinradi, is no longer appropriate in the city, which is split by class into many com disparate communities. And it has already started to be lost in the segment of Cloud Howe and the mutual incomprehension of the mill workers and some of the longer standing locals. Um, an issue for the reader is that it's less than clear what Mitchell is trying to do as he develops the character of you. And I've just said this to John, I'm very sure where he was going. Uh, Ewan is certainly a very flawed hero. The granite of the title appears to have as much to do with the character of Ewan as the city. And as the no novel uh, progresses, Ewan becomes harder and coarser. Um, some have described the portrayal of Ewan as a Ewan is a strong portrayal of a communist leader in the making. Others have pointed out that the actions of Ewan and Jim Trees did not accord with CP policy at the time, or have suggested that a leader of workers should be more able to relate to their aspirations and be more like them uh, than, than he was. I think a close reading of Grey Granite suggests that Mitchell did not intend Ewan to be taken as the ideal communist leader. In the second chapter of Grey Granite, uh, um, Ellen asks him, are you losing heart? He said, Eh? And that, oh, about capitalism. Losing heart would do a lot of good, wouldn't it? She said something then, queer kid, that he was to remember. Anyhow, your heart's not in it at all. Only your head and imagination. Uh, and a few pages later, Mark Leghorn is talking with Chris about Ewan, and she says, she wouldn't trust Ewan, fine loon, but with a daft like glower in his eyes. Oh, this communism stuff's not canny. It's just a religion, though the Reds say it's not and make out that they don't believe in God. Now that may have been intended to represent Mark Leghorn's rather jaundiced view just, but it's related in the context of a comment about Ewan and comes close in the heels of, of Ellen's observation. I just feel it's intended as a, a reflection of, of what, what his ideology had maybe become to Ewan. Um, and meanwhile Chris casts an astute eye on his coldness and feels a pity for Ellen. Um, Ewan seems to go from a stage where he sets up the Youth League, organises the Tanner Hop and briefly addresses it where uh, the, the people there, and which he engages well with people in their aspirations, that they've a right to dance and have it slick. Uh, Henderson's um, breed, Barley Breed and Painted Room, uh, th that they have a right to be enjoying themselves and they have a right to a decent life. Um, later he seems harder, less caring. His behaviour is sectarian, manipulative. He and Jim Trees are agreed that the explosion at Gowan and Globes should be used for propaganda purposes, but it's you and who decides that they should spread the story it was deliberate to test the effects of poison gas in a crowd. And it's a corruption of the truth tantamount to some betrayal of his former work rate, mates and comrades, when there's plenty to say about lack of proper care of the workplace in, in the, the first instance. And it certainly jars me as somebody who's cared about health and safety, and the safety of workers for, at a practical level for a lot of years. His ultimate rejection of Ellen is callous and cold-hearted and extreme and says much about his humanity and his ability to relate to people. Mitchell was clear that he was a revolutionary writer. If he did set out to use Ewan as a vehicle for his views on history and class and the cruelty to which humans are subjected, then he did that very effectively, I feel. Um, the big question then is, did he intend to then demonstrate the difficulty of being a revolutionary, the dangers of letting commitment to an ideological position come between yourself and the main victims? Uh, of that class system, the workers with whom you needed to build a common cause. Does he deliberately have you and lose it, or does, does he just lose it himself in terms of his control of character? It's, it's, it's not obvious. But it's not the only puzzle in Grey Granite. The lines you and speaks to Chris near the end uh, are an enigma for many writers. There always w will be you and, uh, you and I, I think, Mother. It's the old fight that will never have a finish whatever names we give to it. The fight in the end between freedom and God. It's not at all obvious which of them is freedom and which of them is God because Chris doesn't seem God to me. Um, and, and Ewan doesn't necessarily seem freedom, uh, even if that's what he aspires to. The other is the ending, just Chris die, that die in the barmican. It's, it's, it's the uh, puzzle. It's the oblivion which comes in our final. It can be read as a rendering up of life in due time to eternal change. Uh, is identified, you know, in, in Chris's view of the, the land. Uh, but Chris, Chris is still no more than 40. And okay, you know, um, Mitchell didn't grow very old himself, but, but um, I, I think he was able to understand that 40 was not old enough to just die naturally in a hilltop. Either way, the cl we queer is collectively, I think, one of the finest works in Scottish literature. And I believe Mitchell should be placed up there among the markers he claimed to despise sometimes. Not only do his political views not undermine his artistic value, they render the novel rich and enduring. 
He pursues his polemical intentions without compromising his characters, which is hard to do. Um, the argument that art must not be tainted by political intent is a rather precious and ultimately barren one. It's one I used to, going back at myself and falling into my own trap, think of as being particularly English, but I mean a particular sort of English novel, you know, the drawing room novel that, that must not be uh, engaged in, in anything more than that, but of course that's an unfair assumption as well, so it's quite widespread. But a work of art such as Picasso's Garnica can be used to say infinitely more than most history books ever could. And the same applies to the art of the novel. It's just thinking around my own recent reading. Uh, a quick cast about the boat uh, comes up with Roma Term, uh, who only discovered recently, which has much enhanced my understanding of the late conflict in Sri Lanka and, and made it made me feel it here, you know, rather than just in my head. Amitav Ghosh, a sea of poppies set just before the Opium Wars in British Imperial Indi uh, uh, India, cast light in the coercion of farmers in Bihar to grow poppies for the factory, and in the indentured labour of uh, Indian, the movement of an indentured Indian labour to cut sugar cane for the British Empire in Mauritius, Trinidad and so on. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's very telling, I'm really waiting for the next parts of the trilogy to come. Um, Patrick Gale as well, it's not just in international issues, Patrick Gale writes novels which tell you something about the uh, issues in people's lives, like uh, the book which is about um, an artist with uh, bipolar disorder, uh, which which made me think hard about living with, with bipolar, as, as bipolar. Uh, and then of course there's Dickens, uh, you know, so, so, so any uh, chat, I think Catherine Mansfield um, said the artist takes a long look at life, he says softly, so this is what life is, is it? And he proceeds to express that in the rest he leaves. And I think James Leslie Mitchell was such an artist. Very broad. Good broad general outline, yeah. which no doubt will provoke some discussion. So I think we'll open it up for some comments or points of view, questions even, you know? The big question I have about Lewis Grassic, I mean the first time I'd come across this idea that his writings were actually quite socialist was when I actually um, saw in the Tribune um, guide to um, places for lefties to visit, I don't know if you've huh? seen it, it's actually quite, no. a, quite a good guide. It actually lists the Lewis Grassic Gibbon Centre mm -hmm. in, in Lawrence Kirk alongside the Turku for later. And the big question I then have from that is that since it's actually in the curriculum for people in Scotland, why isn't it, I mean I think Scotland is a radical place incidentally, but why is it that um, we've seen perhaps the SNP come through as a, as a, as a party um, here as opposed to uh, you know, the Labour Party would need any other left wing party for that matter? You want me to answer that? I mean, I'll just say briefly, I think the SNP have played well into that um, um, uh, aspect of Scotland. They've presented themselves pretty much as a social democratic party. It's up to us now to challenge them, uh, to deliver uh, on, on that. I think that's absolutely right. And the Labour Party, if I may make them so bold, I don't want to offend our Labour Party friends present, <laughs> uh, because because our union is working hard to re-engage with the Labour Party at present. But really, people have been sick of seeing policies shipped up from London, I think, and not relating properly to Scotland, which is uh, something the party needs to come to terms with. Could I pose a, a, a different way, please? Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, from the time from the, he was writing there, they were coming from a stage, as you were talking about, from agrarian into mm. industrial work and I'll just say as an aside I might be slain for it if you scratch an Aberdonian you'll find a peasant under the skin <laughs> Absolutely. And I don't mean that in a bad way no, no. I don't mean in a bad way they're only a generation away <coughs> Absolutely, from, yeah. being, from being, we from are. being yeah, peasants yeah. and they came up and they came up with struggle and yeah. fights yeah. and when the cities came up like Dundee and Aberdeen and things like that for the Industries came up with the jute and the shipbuilding, etc. There was organisations mm -hmm. that, and eventually they were lost. That sense of organisation was lost. Yeah. yeah. And where we are now mm -hmm. is the result of losing that organisation. Yes. Yeah. And maybe the organisation is because of unemployment or things not happening, because it's, it's very, very hard to organise and employ people. 
in an economic sense. Mm. I mean, to strike and things like that. They can organise them to go Absolutely. march down the street, but it's hard for them to make a difference to the economy. It's not just in Aberdeen either. I, mean, I don't mean that, no, I'm just giving that The time that Gibbon's yeah. talking about, uh, that uh, Mitchell's talking about, I, I think, you know, that it's Scottish. Um, Scottish economic life was really in flux, more than in e England or, mm -hmm. or, or anywhere else. I believe the, the collapse of those um, uh, industries already in uh, a, a more radical fashion was leaving people high and dry um, and undermining the organisation, which might have been better um, than it was other, in other parts of mm -hmm. these islands. Uh, and it's still something we're struggling with. It's not that people have ever chosen to leave their unions. Uh, it's that they lose the jobs, the jobs disappear mm -hmm. which were unionised yes. and they have to go and start again from scratch uh, in, in industries which are very difficult to organise. So the question is then, how do you do it? It's difficult. Well that's not necessarily, you're a, you're a, you're a, you're a, you're a, you know, but yes I, I, I would agree with everything that George says and uh, it is interesting just hearing George. My father actually cycled to Aberdeen from Bucky, age yeah, yeah. 14. Um, his mother and sisters took the bus. Him. <laughs> <laughs> and brought him back. He, he arrived in Aberdeen with, in the middle of the night with a slip of paper telling him where to stay. Yeah, yeah. And um, it was, now as you say, there was this uh, the heavy industrial collapse of Scotland at that period, or partial collapse. Mm -hmm. I mean, in large parts of Scotland, that wasn't, it wasn't here. I mean, there was no collapse here in the 30s. Instead, what there was, and George, you know, put his finger on it, there was a huge influx of people yes. from the surrounding area. So the unique feature of Aberdeen is it's the only British city that's never sucked in a workforce from much wider, either from Ireland or India or whatever. It's always just sucked in. The, the, the surrounding areas. Yeah. It does now though. Um, like it does not Exactly. The, the huge <laughs> the the change here. I mean, for, no, for everybody. No, I mean, we're we're now. I mean, Aberdeen's population is, you know, massively changing uh, uh, now. But until that, uh, then it, it has this uh, unusual feature. And the organisations. I mean, one of the things was it was it was Scotland's poorest city, but didn't seem to be so. Mm. You know, if you came from Glasgow or Dundee. And uh, you know, it's been a, it's quite an interesting book. It uh, just been published by somebody you may know. I I, I don't know. There's a guy who lives in Glasgow, but came from. It. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, George. <laughs> but saying about Aberdeen had to be the most careful. The working class was the most careful working class uh -huh. in Britain because it was so poor. So we had yeah. the highest proportion of members of the co-op and so forth, and the highest proportion of lots of working organisations. There is a reason for the end, but it didn't come across as such because. It had to be so careful and. Uh, What's his name? Can you? Can uh, you I can't. It's the the book is called Beyond the Granite. He's oh, yeah. written books about Glasgow. He, he's uh -huh. from Aberdeen. He's worked all these years in Glasgow. And he's obviously a radical. But the highest proportion of folk in the co-ops, but a definition of poor. It's a definition of. I'm and not enjoying the co-ops. Yes. <laughs> of careful. But, well, you didn't careful. get asked here. You just got told. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, it's, again, some people here may know this, but just uh, because of you know, what we're speaking about. I mean, my father, when he was 14, he went to the Communist Party office in Aberdeen because he was unfairly dismissed from his first job and uh, he didn't get his pay. And, uh, it was, and what would be interesting about what you're saying is that it was very much that Communist Party of the class against class <laughs> sphere and so forth. Yes. And it was very, you know, I mean, massively aggressive. Uh, and they got him his money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Got him easy. laughs> but they used to do, I mean, if I was the older, you know, folk uh, still around, they used to do um, uh, 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 squatting in houses yeah. and um, yeah. and organise the neighbourhood. When John said about the, the co-op, they'd actually just tell the neighbours, if anybody comes to evict these people, you've all yes, to go into yes, the room. to go and occupy And it. these would be the people coming yeah. from the Kinradis and so forth. Yes. Uh, 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 Area, so. but yeah, yeah, they also collected John Landragon who mm -hmm. come along to the Unemployed Workers Centre when I first came to Aberdeen. He talked about that particular period, like direct action. Mm -hmm. I mean, he obviously mentioned about the fights with the black shirts and that, but mm -hmm. I remember him specifically talking about that they'd got word about uh, a row of houses that were boarded up and uh, weren't being rented out or anything. And I think they belonged to the council or private landlord or something mm -hmm. at the time. And he just says, I'm a good name, but it was just got to do together. They, they occupied this row of houses, set it all up, and they collected the money. 
Mm -hmm. Like to exactly. prevent money anything else, and also protected and guarded it, you know. And I think you're, you're right, Barney, that there was that sense of of camaraderie that was born mm -hmm. from, from 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 the level of poverty, and also whenever there was a ship uh, from Spain down at the harbour, and there was a strike, and the Spanish government introduced a national minimum wage, mm -hmm. proper front government introduced national minimum wage, the ship owners refused to pay it, so the, the ship. Uh, sailors went and strike, oh, yeah, yeah. and they, the guys, Landragon and Cooney and them, uh, befriended them. You know, I presume maybe they would think the Communist Party offices in Belmont Street or something like no, that. The, was it? The time I'm speaking about, it was actually in Shore Lane. Shore Lane, which right. was really, but that was uh, 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 as a, so the, as I say, the class against class period there, and then they moved eventually to. Uh, uh, the Belmont Street was the Trades Council. Trades Council, that's yeah. right. Uh, 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 the Communist Party office. Orchard Road. Orchard Road. Orchard Road, that's right, because that's, that's where we find years the ago, flag. Years ago, I, I read a book by a guy called Comic Phil Pratt, and you guys will know. And he's or a guy, he was a Communist. Stephanie, that's right. Stephanie, I think that. But he's the man that took the folk into the underground. That's to right. To save them from the bombs. Uh, but his book's like a manual for any <laughs> left wing party. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Comet, Labour, or anything at all, mm -hmm. uh, how to work. And what he would say, he would shut the door to somebody and say, What can we do for you? And he would give them the problems and he would deliver a solution for them. Mm -hmm. And he did it all the way out. Doesn't matter whether it's Communists or Labour, mm -hmm. and Labour should, probably should be doing that because yeah. Communists could help, but Labour aren't doing it. And his, his view was you go and talk. You talk to the people, you build it up from the grassroots level, which sometimes you can do the structure you have just now. But if you have local people working, local trade unions working, because trade unions used to be in the old days, folk would come with problems. So you're not trade union problems. They would come with mm -hmm. human problems, they would come with, I can't pay this, I can't do this, and you'd help out. And that's maybe a thing we should be looking back at, looking at to move forward, because it won't all be done by talk, yeah. it has to be done only by action and folk interacting mm -hmm. with people who may or may not vote for you. Well, if, I, if, if I look at um, the book, well, as you said, uh, Burton's book is quite good, because it is, in a sense, though it's a reflection of memoirs of how they went about the business, basically. Mm -hmm. um, if you take what happened here three years ago when we had the massive campaign and the big protest against the council cuts. That was born from the fact that myself and Graham Tram became very quickly aware because of our network of contacts that there was, just like that, we groups were springing up, you know, the parents to save this school, protecting this group, protecting that, protecting this daycare centre. There, there was a bit, it does nothing roughly, and it was, they were just springing up, but then the good thing about the modern technology is they then started to communicate yeah. with each other. Yeah. Yeah. And But it was the Trades Council that was the body that was able to pull it together and organise the demonstration. And of course we paid the price for that by the, the, the co co council people now in charge by putting this effective ban on this marching down Union Street by saying they'll charge us. Mm. We've got a bit Silly. of a... Oh why? Oh why? The cost of three grand. Serious thing. SNP. Absolutely. Now we fought against it and campaigned yeah. behind the scenes and all the rest of it. And only again, in spite of your point George, because of our, I suppose in a sense, level of community-based credibility, mm. we were able even to get the tip off from one of the community police officers that said to us that if you hold your demonstration from where we now go, from the graveyard, down the way, there's no need to block off and do this and do that, which is what their argument was that they were propagating, but you know, the real political reason was this was spite. Mm. Back at the yeah. trade school, oh, land the community, yeah. we're doing it. Now, so hopefully we can change that round right next year. Allies, they must yeah. be <laughs> That's what's going to come on to the... Well, there is another reason for that. Uh, if we look at yeah. the, uh, the point, I suppose, about, about books, if, and I think you were, you were saying it, George, if we look at the factories that produced working class radicals, it was very intense, organised, working class based industries, the shipyards. Mm -hmm. there was, most of the Labour councillors at one time, when I came to Aberdeen, were all products of or connected to places like Hald Russell Shipyard, mm -hmm. Jim Wynas. I don't know about uh, Jim Lamont's background, was, but I think he was on the yeah, draft side. You know? uh, and all had come into contact 
But when you talked um, the radical contact they had was that there was there was book clubs that would have presumably passed yeah. books round, you know. And when you read the stories of others, whether it be Belfast shipyard, the big industrialised places, they had the book clubs, the talk, the poetry, they encouraged people to, to, to talk and to learn about mm -hmm. the aspect of the messages that were coming from books and poetry, in fact, matter paintings as well. I mean, Guernic yeah. is a good yeah, example yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah. And I, what it, it teaches us from my point of view is it's about the need to get back to that culture. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I, what I do now is a matter of interest of the education courses. Uh, we run quite a few, but the ones I have the responsibility for in Aberdeen, I read extracts of the ragged trouser and philanthropists. Because as you said, Pat, that book had an influence on you, mm -hmm. you know, in a class sense. Well, the ragged trouser and philanthropists had that same connection yeah. to me in a community born of yeah. violence yeah. that you run around like a headless chicken, like a young kid, basically, their teenage years, not knowing which way your route's going to go and all these pressures on you. And I was introduced to that book and as a consequence it changed my life basically mm. because cuts through the sectarian, cuts through stuff, the sectarian stuff but yeah. it brought out this whole new world you see and then I read extracts from it first of all I ask has anybody ever heard of the book normally one person has heard mm -hmm. it normally you know know of it very few have ever read it and then I just read a couple of pages mm -hmm. and it, the bit I read those that uh, I've read it it's the bit of the start of the book when Hunter the foreman's approached by the unemployed guy on the street who's obviously desperate to get some work and there's this conversation, it's, it's the same, same, same theme basically, rural poverty, yeah. time, small town poverty, the guy's working out and he says, right okay, yes. right okay, we'll have to work for the new rate sort of thing, you know, so he's, he's got it in mind, who am I pulling down a peg or two, and of course we know he goes into the house looking and searching, hoping to catch one of them smoking or not going about, and there's these three or four pages that represents everything that I come across when you're dealing with bullies in workplaces yeah. and supervisors giving people, men and women, a hard time. <coughs> and you read it out, and it's about how he parks the bike, how he sneaks in, the stealth of it all, and the nose out, the smell, and all the rest of it. And then he goes around shouting and bawling and picking on them and all the rest of it, and then trying to figure out. And of course, he then has a go to old Philpot, you see, and he's trying to think of a reason to get rid of him, but he's going to get rid of him anyway. And he says, that ah, doesn't matter, I'll just make up a reason, you see. But it's that moment in the book when they all think he's gone and they're all shouting, hey, Barney, it's a bastard gone, all this kind of stuff. And they're all going, oh, have a look out the window, you see. And of course, he's lit up the bed. He goes, look out the window, and he describes the rain coming down it. And that's just that moment. He looks out and he catches Hunter looking up at him. You know, and he just, I'm going to go for a comfort <laughs> break. Ah. But you two guys said something that was great to me when you said that we need to do something to make a change and you talk about the books mm -hmm. and the educating, whether it's meetings like this, mm -hmm. doesn't have to be morning star meetings, we believe hard to meetings, it could be mm -hmm. any meeting at all. Mm -hmm. And I think you two should get together. I'd be willing to help in that. Good job. Because yeah. I'm doing nothing. So <laughs> I'm unemployed. Yeah. <laughs> get you right if well. job. But if you guys get together mm -hmm. yeah, and set something up for you're going to get it doesn't have to be overtly political, mm -hmm. but just getting for to to talk. I'd be very, very happy right. to help with that. It's about encouraging, as you say, the spread. Like Barney said, beyond the ground. You know? uh -huh. <laughs> I'm going to go for a wee wee now. Yeah, right. <laughs> I thought of that, yeah. Yeah. Right, but seriously, if you guys, because you, you're the union man and you're the labour man, mm -hmm. right? I'm, I'm a C, I'm a comic guy here, I'm okay, that's it. But I'd be very, very happy to get involved yeah, in that. And I would. I would do the work for you. I'll just yeah. keep you informed of what I'm doing. George has great organisational skills. I'll be doing the things for you. So yeah. I'm going for a wee wee now. Do you want a wee wee? No, I'm fine. No. no. <laughs> So it's interesting when you read those bits and just, you know, it takes 10 minutes to read it. People recognise it. Right, and then they're looking yeah. around and they're saying, when was that? And they said, 100, 100 years ago, isn't it? Where are you times, yeah. you know? And they're going, oh, that's just like me, that's just yeah. like, you know, so-and-so and all the rest. And, says, <coughs> and when I read it for the first time, I was in the building trade. We had, you know, a four-man like that and all that. I was spying on people and all the rest of it. And it just brought it home to me. Yes. It is a class thing, you know, it's in, 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 in the broadest meaning of it, you're still still the worker. So. The book, definitely, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I, quite frankly, have not read his books. Mm -hmm. I know of his books and I haven't got, basically, I haven't got around to read because he gets so distracted. I mean, I took a book off about Guernica on his holiday and I haven't even finished that when yeah. I brought it back, you know, but... Is that the Dave Bowling? The Dave Bowling one. It's oh, it's fantastic, you know, because, yeah, yeah. as you say, with uh, <coughs> uh, Mitchell, he, he brings into life, into play, before the bomb and occurred, all these characters, yeah. you know, and, of course, all from the land and yes. the, the, the connection with church. Oh, I absolutely. I mean, that, you know what, 
that could be anywhere, it could be any village, you know, so it's, it's good in that point. Mm -hmm. But the shop stewards are on the course is the absence of the knowledge. Tall Puddle Martyrs yeah. is the other one I asked them about. They know maybe of it, but yeah. don't know the, the history to it. Yeah. And as, you know, as, as George says, I think we have a responsibility to do that because we get so caught up and busy in our own work. We should take time out, even if it is only five or ten minutes at a Labour Party meeting or a trade union meeting or any any type of meeting mm -hmm. where we've got some connection with people that we can say, you know, I was reading this poem the other night or I've been reading the book basically, as you say Barney, you know, beyond the granite it's got a, a point to make, you see. You know, John if, or Carl if you want to make any comment. You know I'm fine just now. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the, the John uh, uh, Aberdeen has written a couple of novels recently that, in some ways, do, do, do you, do, have you read them? No, or, no, no. Okay. Who's he? Is he local? He, well, he is. He's Aberdonian, and he now lives partly in Aberdeen, but mainly in Orkney. All right, yeah. And yeah. Um, his book, the, the, the one that's called A Man's Bed, A-M-A-N-D-E, -A -A -E, it's a French woman, A Man's Bed, is more or less, as a, it would seem to me, as a conscious attempt to try and have us a more uh, recent mm -hmm. uh, similar thing. So it would be interesting. Uh, interesting. Uh, his, again, the family like there is strong. His, his dad was a very, in, a long time ago, his dad was a very prominent communist leader. Yeah. Let's say. Um, but, uh, and, back on, and back body to the community contact with the trade unions, whenever there was an issue kicked off up in Orkney to do with the sheltered wardens mm. in the particular complex that he was connected with and the way the council was behaving itself, taking that service away, he very quickly got in touch with me because one of them had said, no, we're in, the, you know, the TNG as it was at the time, we know Tommy Campbell, and between the two of us, he was brilliant doing that advocacy work in the background, uh, finding out, doing the research, stuff I didn't have the time to do about the connections with the tenants contracts mm -hmm. and all the rest of it and we just blew the council right out of the water like you know much to their annoyance it was a well organized community based campaign backed up by yeah. myself doing, doing stuff inside the council you know mm -hmm. and that's back to the point which no doubt we'll discuss on Saturday Barney at the meeting down at the university is uh, you're aware of this discussion to do with the uh, post-mortem uh, within the Labour Party as to you know the outcome mm -hmm. of the elections mm -hmm. Um, and uh, it's like as you say in his book, you know, it was uh, in the same sense. There's the, the postmortems of people's lives, you know, about mm -hmm. the First World War and what happened, yeah. and people find out things. It's going to be quite a, I think, an interesting and sharp debate on Saturday. You know? to, to slightly declare an interest, I should say that he's put on the internet a, a chapter of a novel about current day Aberdeen, and it's the malfeasance in the council. And it features a slightly sleazy right. social democratic <laughs> councillor That's called right. Bill Rubble. Right. <laughs> 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 I, I was going to pick up Pat's point about um, his portrayal in the, in the novel, Mitchell's portrayal of, uh, of Ewan in his yeah, yeah. communist phase. Um, yeah. And I, th I think you've actually put your finger on um, it is a slightly uneasy yes, piece yeah. in the novel and I think it's because probably Mitchell was never really, I don't know, he might have been briefly it's, in the It's so part. clear whether he was ever in the yeah, Communist Party, isn't it? Very tangentially yeah. and he had no idea mm, of how it operated right. in yeah. a sense on the ground. One has that sense. Yeah. Um, and he, he's almost reproducing there the kind of stereotype yeah. that he would have got out of the press of the time yes. about communist agents coming in and manipulating people mm -hmm. and doing the kind of things that to some extent are portrayed in that, uh, in that yes. passage in the novel. Like um, his view of Jim Treese that yeah, he precisely. would sell his wife for him. Yeah, for yeah, a, a, I mean, right. you're thinking. It's, it's that kind okay. of portrayal <laughs> of a, a very fanatic. And it, that it wasn't even, I mean, the Communist Party has been through various phases, some better mm. and some worse, but that wasn't really yeah. with the character of the Communist Party in Britain. Uh, which of course came out of earlier socialist movements, yes. mm -hmm. yes. organically, of course. and drew their traditions with them. Um, and even in, if you're referring to Phil Paratin, uh, and of course his work in Stepney and the East mm -hmm. End was in precisely mm -hmm. this period, mm -hmm. it was between 1932 mm -hmm. and 1936, yeah. where they were trying to combat fascism. And yeah. he made the argument that it wasn't enough just to be propagandist, you actually had to be 
on the ground. Mm -hmm. You had to actually talk to the people who yes. fascists had influence, yes. and not just talk to them, mobilize them, get them involved, get them fighting, get them organized, and not in a manipulative way, because mm -hmm. they were fighting on real issues of the mess yeah, yeah. and the other issues. So um, I, I think that was that's probably why Grassic Gibbon's novel it hasn't had the same resonance and use as, say, The Ragged Trousers yes. of the Philanthropist yes. um, has. And there, are, um, and there are other novels that I think also have the same resonance. I suppose James Bark's novels, so we haven't had in this series, but James Bark uh, wrote some wonderful novels. I think from a, a much closer understanding of working class politics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Jack London. And there's Jack London. Yeah, well, yeah. some of his, yeah, I, I mean, some of Jack, yes. yeah, there's a, there's a kind Not of, the again, there's an uneasy, uneasy <laughs> element within yeah. Jack London, I think, too. Um, uh, because it, 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 but it does show a closer involvement mm -hmm. with the working class movement because Jack London had that through the yeah. experiences. And, I was hoping for your feedback on that. Um, I, I, I tend to feel that, that um, Mitchell, in spite of the fact he'd been off the land for a lot of mm -hmm. years by then, had um, more of a close feel for what he yeah. was doing, yeah, and, and including and drawing out the class politics of it, you know, because, um, I, I mean, that, that was, in, in polemical terms, I, I, I felt that was effective, because yeah. uh, for me that was the setting uh, in which I was brought up, and it, it assisted me greatly to, to see that somebody else put that in a, a class context, because, you know, you, you, you know these these things because you're, you're living them, the, the, the gap between... Um, the, the, the itinerant farm, uh, farm workers and the, the, the farmers who own their, their, their land and the tenant farmers in the, the middle. And the, the different way kids are treated in school, which was very marked then, you know. Uh, and it was much more likely to be the farm workers' kids who left school without being able to read and so on. Uh, and, it's, it, you know, it had, it, had, it had always rankled with me from when I was old enough to, to notice it and having him have his characters express those things was, was, was very valuable and I, I felt I got mo more of a, a feeling of him being steady footed yeah. over his, yeah, his rural yeah, stuff. That, that's, that's the part of the yes. novel. Was it yes, than in yeah. the city. Yeah. Was it a fair comment then because I, I kind of vaguely remember although it was the English strike, the, the Burston school strike which was centred of course in the rural community mm -hmm. that uh, there was issues down there about organised community because the farm owners, you know, misuse the children as labour mm -hmm. and of course mm -hmm. took the children out of the school yes. when they seemed fit. Yes. And my understanding is, well, that's my understanding is that the origins of the Tatty Holiday in Scotland in the yeah. schools. Not just the origins, they used yeah. to set the dates of it according yes. to the expected the date and not that yeah. long ago. Yeah. I mean, that's I was a teacher right. when right. they stopped the uh, councillors in Aberdeenshire discussing the date when it would be best to get the tatties in. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, famously, the union representative on the education committee said that he was not going to have the tatty barons of Aberdeenshire to <laughs> set in the school hall. His members were going on all the tatty barons are very important. <laughs> That's what I want to understand was that but, uh, um, yeah. I was a head Genuinely. teacher in a school in uh, Orkney and uh, I came across the record and uh, I'm ashamed to say that they were eventually thrown out, which is terrible. But it was a re the, the head teacher's notebook of you know of what's going on. And in 1914, the two members of the school board came out from Kirkwall and asked every boy in the class to stand up who'd reached standard seven, the equivalent of part of being completing your primary education. Yeah. And they were all told to leave. Uh. They were just all put out the schoolhouse, uh, the yes. school room. That's you get because there was a shortage of food. Farm labour, aren't they? It's quite sure. So it's, uh, it is, uh, it's, it's called capitalism. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 we're not necessarily talking a, a long time, well, I suppose, I'm afraid, yeah. yeah. I remember being aware of it at school, it's, it's secondary school, I became m more aware of it, and I remember, um, I'd, 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 uh, uh, I assumed it was an educational write-off. My parents never expected much of me. Uh, and it was only when I was in secondary school I suddenly started paying attention one day and thought I might have done more than this. Um, and I, I was um, sent to redo a third year in a, in a, a higher class. I was learning uh, German or whatever. But I was still pretty you know, laid back about it all, pretty um, semi-detached, I suppose. Um, and I was standing in the class one day waiting for the teacher to come in. 
and it just suddenly struck me like a stone that the janitor was trooping around the side of the school with these boys all behind him. And there was a set of boys who um, stayed in, there was a special class for them one year, I think, it, I think it was, in the first year, and they never got out to first year. Most of them were the same boys until it was time for them to leave school. Some of them were leaving school without being able to read at all. And it suddenly became c quite clear to me that they were, none of them were the, the grocer's son or the doctor's son or, or, or anything like that. You know, they were all uh, working class kids. And I thought, that's deliberate. They are oh, cheap labour in the school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're, they've been prepared to be somebody's cheap labour elsewhere, you know, and they're never going to be allowed to do any more than that. I remember, you know, it was the first time I, I, I saw it in front of me and felt angry about it. But well, that's what they're doing now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you don't need an education class an anymore. Yeah, yeah. You, can, you can just put a, Go a to class vacation and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But here, a, a, a quick question. That when we talk about, you know, put your, your legs on top, but when you take it from there, from what, 80, 90, 80 years ago to now, mm -hmm. if we were sitting in front of all the crowd of folk, young folk in Aberdeen, and we were saying, saying Different languages, but doesn't get the same ideas across. We hear that to our, my embarrassment, I had a, a YCL head man up here in Glasgow, I didn't know what we it came up, and I went to his stall. And he saw up at the shopping centre there, and he's talking about poverty in Aberdeen. And there is pockets of poverty in Aberdeen, yeah. but not like the beer of Glasgow or mm -hmm. anything, right? And these folk are up, these young folk are talking to him, and he's saying, but you're living in poverty. And you're saying, we don't live in poverty. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the question is, how do you take what we've been talking about here, translate it into ways to talk, not just the younger folk, but the older folk too, and do it. And that's hopefully maybe one of the outcomes of what we do here. Yeah. And I'll go back to my thing, and I'll offer you guys, as a minister, there's a lot of young people.